Hello and good morning everyone. Now today we will be uh, moving forward to our uh, question discussion section of this systemic bacteriology and we have discussed uh, in uh, future about this uh, up to 23 that is uh, about salmonella enterica subspecies typhi that was the clinical picture of your typhoid. Now moving forward towards our one another question and that is a five year old child of an eastern Europe immigrant family is brought to the pediatric clinic the child is febrile, but we can exhaust it from a week of paroxysmal cough with inspiratory whoops. So there is no fever, but patient is having patient is exhausted due to the continuous cough with inspiratory whoop. That is a feature of your whooping cough. That is the bordetella portuchus. Okay. So frequently associated with the vomiting, the parents profuse religious objection to the childhood vaccination but permit the withdrawal of the blood sample which reveals lymphocytosis. So this is the classical picture of your portuchus. In a portuchus there may be a unvaccinated, there will be unvaccinated uh, children that will develop this continuous whooping cough. Okay, there will be the continuous uh, cough followed by the inspiratory whoop and there will be the lymphocytosis and also as well as after inspiratory whoop there will be a post vomiting there will be the vomiting present in the uh, <clears throat> baby and these all are the characteristic feature that is the clear cut picture of your portuchus that is borderline portuchus infection now they are asking about it what is their ask what is the question the question is production of lymphocytes Production of lymphocytosis, insulin secretion, and histamine sensitization are result of which of the attribute of this organism. So, what is the main culprit to cause all this symptom? Mainly, this lymphocytosis, insulin secretion, and histamine sensitization. And these all are the features. You, if you remember your border portuchus, then there were there was actually a lot of. Let me go to the border tala. Pasturella bordetella. So, if you remember the bordetella, they have they are talking about a lot of things like like uh, Clefsella, Entero, Hemorrhagic E. coli. We have talked. This is Pseudomonas, Legionella, Brucella, bordetella. So we have seen over there that this is the increase. This has the uh, gram-negative aerobic occupation like virulence factor include prostitutious toxin that is like GI adenocyclase is increased and tracheal cytotoxin the clinical stage is cateral proximal and convolucent and there are other toxin as well like portuchus toxin then this is the portuchus toxin that was responsible for causing all this uh, that in disable your GI and increase the cyclic AMP and there is a continuous cough and other feature as well. So we should always remember if we are talking about the portuchus then they are talking about the portuchus toxin. So these all are the feature are mainly of your portuchus toxin. So your answer will be actually this will be your answer portuchus toxin will be your answer because you should you should understand this this will be your answer portuchus toxin okay so portuchus toxin is your answer let's move forward if you can you can also identify you can uh, the all the options you can uh, you can discuss all the options as well because all the options all will be not your answer because if you're talking about the border portuchus there is there is nothing related to motility or adenocyclase toxin or beta hemolysin or anaerobic growth or filamentous hemagglutinin although filamentous hemagglutinin is one of the component of your border portuchus but the characteristic feature is due to portuchus toxin that you have to understand so the best answer is your always the answer now coming to the another question that is the Clinical laboratory reports the presence of O157S7 and you know one O157 S7 is the name another name of entero hemorrhagic E. coli. If you remember, this is the Legionella Borella. If you go through the USML step one, then microbiological section, then where we can see this E. coli. And <clears throat> among E. coli, this O157S7 is your another name is the say you can say serotypic name of your enterohemorrhagic E. coli which is causing this hemolytic uremic syndrome they are similar to this sega toxin which causes hemolytic uremic syndrome there is a trade of anemia thrombocytopenia and kidney injury so these are mainly dysentery toxin alone causes necrosis and inflammation does not form in sorbitol so this is one of the another point versus other E. coli EHCC associated with the hemolytic uremic syndrome hemorrhage and hamburger this is usually caused by transmitted by undercooked meat raw leafy vegetable so if you have 
discuss that portion now let's come over here and what they're asking they're asking about the clinical laboratory reports presence of 0157s7 that is enterohemorrhagic e coli ehec of e coli in in the blood stool of six children children ages three to five who attended the local pitting zoo zoo so they have gone to the zoo and this acquired this orga organism now they are suffering from this uh, uh, bloody diarrhea and this is because they have grown this O157S7 that is a sorbitol non-fermenter and now they are asking the, these young children would be the increased risk of developing so they are not asking you about your organism you know they have given you the information that this is the enterohemorrhagic E. coli and then can be transmitted from this hamburger they cause this bloody diarrhea but their complication is hemolytic uremic syndrome and they are asking about what is the risk this guys this young people will have and obviously they will develop this hemolytic uremic syndrome your b is the answer so you have to understand it will not be buboes, it will not be infant botulism, renal stone or isotretic diarrhea. They are talking a different organism. We are talking about the same enterohemorrhagic E. coli and that is hemolytic uremic syndrome. So you have to understand in this way. Okay, and if you want, I can take you again over there. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157S7 that causes the hemolytic uremic syndrome. So there will be the trial of anemia, thrombocytopenia as well as there will be the what? Uremia and that is hemolytic uremic syndrome. So hope you have understand about that question discussion and let's move forward uh, okay so at 65 year old now we have a old people develops pneumonia respiratory tract infection there is pneumonia the organism isolated from the sputum are gram positive cocci okay now they are they are giving me a hint you have pneumonia the, the young this uh, this uh, 65 year old gentleman have pneumonia and that is due to this gram positive cocci so they have narrowed down into yours one of the group gram positive cocci that are again they are narrowing narrowing into the alpha hemolytic so if you remember if you remember from here they are talking about this gram positive organism which is alpha hemolytic okay so what are the options you have so let me go through your gram positive uh, region section of your usml step 1 2021 microbiology and I can show you the tree diagram if you're so okay first let's go to the tree diagram and then we'll come we can over here see this is the gram positive organism okay among, among the gram positive they are talking about this alpha hemolytic so alpha hemolytic is this group of organisms so they are all, they can be differentiated there are two actually is bistrococcus biridin and stroboccus pneumonia among them the differentiation is one is Biosolubility, another is optogen sensitivity. So, Streptococcus pneumoniae is biosoluble as well as optogen sensitive. They are differentiated from the Streptococcus viridens. So, we are talking about this Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is optogen sensitivity as well as biosolubility. And obviously, they are talking about pneumonia. So, Streptococcus pneumoniae should be your answer. Now, let's go forward. So, this is the pneumonia. The organism is gram positive, that is alpha hemolytic and blood agar, and sensitive to optogen. Now, your answer is I uh, have been clear. They are already told you gram positive, alpha hemolytic, and there was two organisms, Streptococcus viridens and Streptococcus pneumonia, and among them, optogen sensitive. Optogen sensitive, optogen sensitive is, optogen sensitivity positive is Streptococcus pneumonia. So, your answer is Streptococcus pneumonia. Let's see what they are asking. So, what is structure of the causative agent provides protection against phagocytosis? Now, they haven't asked you about the organism. They have asking you the one of the properties of organism because of which it inhibits the phagocytosis when they infect us, when they, they infect this bacteria infect us. And you have to understand, you have to understand this. We are talking about the this streptococcus pneumonia and that is encapsulated. So, they have capsule. So, that capsule, what this capsule does, let me take you to the uh, streptococcus pneumonia so alpha hemolytic bacteria this is with the uh, streptococcus pneumonia and viridens among that optogen sensitivity streptococcus pneumonia we have got the answer staphylococcus aureus epidermidis streptococcus pneumonia see this in streptococcus pneumonia organism has what are the features they have the encapsulated encapsulated and iga protease optogen sensitivity so these are the feature of your question now so obviously they are talking about the capsule so the structure that prevent from the phagocytosis is capsule so capsulated organism is your capsule is your answer so a is your answer of this question okay let's move more forward so 
A 68-year-old man on chemotherapy for leukemia has developed sepsis due to an infection with Escherichia coli. So they have given you a clear-cut picture. There is a gram-negative bacterial infection. This is a young, this is not a young old man with an chemotherapy undergoing the leukemia. The following day, the patient developed the septic shock and dies. So there was a E. coli infection, systemic E. coli infection, and due to the gram-negative bacteria, and the patient dies. The structure of the bacteria most likely responsible for causing the septic shock in this patient is. So you know, you have discussed about this gram-negative bacteria and then the gram-positive gram and gram-negative bacteria. If you remember the previous thing, uh, we have a two different things that cause gram-negative bacteria to, to cause this shock, septic shock. So this is the endotoxin, endotoxin activity of a gram-negative bacteria which is not present in the gram-positive bacteria. So this endotoxin which is causing this by this mechanism, macrophage activation, complement activation and tissue factor activation and causing the septic shock is due to the due to the endotoxin. Endotoxic activity is the due to lipid A component of your outer membrane, of your lipopolysaccharide which is the component of your outer membrane. So gram-negative bacteria, let me go to the gram-negative bacteria actually. To make you understand, this is exotoxin and endotoxin, um, the differentiation, we have to start from the beginning, I think. Uh, Cantalus positive, whereas microbial, we have talked about this, okay, okay, so look over here, there is the gram positive bacteria, gram negative bacteria, gram positive bacteria has this peptidoglycan thick layer, the gram negative hair bacteria has the outer membrane, in outer membrane they have this outer membrane has lipopolysaccharide, this lipopolysaccharide has the three portion, that is the lipid A component, outer membrane, and this is lipid A component, then polysaccharides, and then there's a porins. So this is structures of this lipopolysaccharide, which is the lipid A is the endotoxin activity, and endotoxin activity will lead to this, what? They will lead to the endotoxic shock, septic shock. So the feature that was responsible for causing this endotoxic shock is lipopolysaccharide. If there will be lipid A, then that is the specific answer. If they are giving a broad, broad term, lipopolysaccharide. Lipid A is a component of the lipopolysaccharide. And then in this way, your B will be the answer. Hope you are understanding. Now, let me... So now moving forward again, we are moving, coming to the uh, another question that is the 12 year old boy. This is the at age 12 from North Carolina. If they are giving you any space, then that you have to actually, if they are showing about any space, then you have to any place of United States of America, then they, you have to understand they are talking about some of the endemic th thing that is prevalent in that particular place. So they are talking about this North Car Carolina and obviously there are a lot of disease that is related to a North Carolina. His is important, okay, North East place is important, present to the ER department with rash, fever and severe headache. So there is a rash, there is a fever, there is a headache that begins three days ago. The rash begins on these arm and legs and then it spread to the trunk. So that is also important. There was a rash, rash, fever and severe headache. Now they have trying to this rash, fever and headache will be a feature of a lot of bacterial and viral infection. But they are trying to focus down. They are giving you a particular diagnosis and by giving another hint that rash begins on his arm and then spread to the trunk. So this is the centripetal. And if you remember, centripetal rash spread is one of the characteristic feature of your Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There is a rickexial disease. In rickexial also the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. If you talk about the endemic and epidemic typhus, the rash is spread from the trunk to the body. So typhus on the trunk and then this rickexia on the wrist. So they are on the arms and leg, then spread to the trunk and they'd have the rash, fever and severe headache. And even North Carolina is an important place for having this tick bite. So your all the characteristic feature, all the uh, component that is given in your question is giving hint to reach to your diagnosis. So a trivial year old from North Carolina present to the ER with the rash, fever and severe headache that begins three days ago. The rash began on his arm and leg and this spread to the tongue. Now the pediatrician noticed that conjunctival redness, the lab test revealed proteinuria, which are the following likely events likely to lead to the child illness. And there are there are with the rash, fever, headache, there will be other uh, conjunctival and GI symptom in Rocky Mountain spotted fever that may lead to the misdiagnosis. So you have to 
stick with your Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and that is due to the tick bite and tick bite is usually in the North Carolina region and North Carolina what are the options? Cutting himself with butchering rabbits. Obviously not. The eating undercooked meat that will be also not be a feature. The hiking in the woods and that is one of the feature where tick will bite. This tick will not bite uh, butchering the rabbit or undercooked meat. They will bite when you go hiking in the woods. By kissing, obviously this is not the kissing disease and not washing his hand. That will also be not because this is not the bacterial disease that will transmit it from the fecal This is the intracellular bacteria that will trans that will require one of the vector to get inside your body and that is the tick bite. So hope you have understood about this North Carolina. Let me take you to the real Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever so you can understand. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Let us revise that. So we have, no, we have this, come down, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, so this is the fungi, Rocky Mountain Mycoplasma Pneumonia, Anaplasmosis, Erlirosis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, this is classical trite of headache fever and rash, which was there, the palm and sole which is the most common, that is the Coxsackie A. Uh, then this uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Syphilis, this was a way to remember. If you talk about the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, this is a tick, bacteria is a tick, despite its name, the disease occur in the South Atlantic states, especially North Carolina and that is the important. They have some of the places very uh, prevalent, very endemic region, very important for the certain diseases and you have to understand that. Rest typically started wrist and ankle, then spread with trunk, palm and sole. This was a Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, in case of tight feet, the rest started in the trunk and then spread to the palm and sole or say into the periphery, that is just opposite. Let's move <coughs> into another question. And the question will be actually, uh, let's end over here and then we can discuss more question in the next lecture. Thank you.